Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, this is our third and final Lou Douglas lecture for the season. Uh, and of course, tonight we're going to be presenting to you Academy Award winner Barbara Trent. Uh, I'd like to sp pay a special welcome, of course, to uh, Mary Douglas, who's with us tonight uh, for, our, for our last lecture of, uh, of this fall. Now, um, Barbara Trent uh, is quite a remarkable woman. Um, and now, as it says on your bill, she went from being a welfare mother to an Academy Award winning filmmaker, and that's very much the truth. You can see the little bit of tchotchke in front of the podium there is, uh, is, is the trophy that she won from the Academy. Uh, and it travels with her everywhere she goes, and it gets progressively more and more dinged up. But uh, I, I believe reading that uh, Barbara feels it demystifies it a bit. And I think that's a good idea. It's passed from so many hands that she's had to re, uh, re-guild it twice. So uh, if you do feel like introducing yourself to the Oscar, he's up there. Um, now the, the movie that, that uh, Barbara won the award for was of course The Panama Deception. And I certainly hope that those of you who had the opportunity last week uh, seized it and got a chance to see this movie. Uh, everybody in this room should have lived through that Panama incursion that we had back in the early 1980s or late 1980s during the Bush administration. Uh, I, for one, remember it as being just a glance on, on network news. Um, and, and now Barbara had, had a big problem with that because it was a, uh, you know, it was something that she felt needed to be explored a little more closely. Here we were, we were invading a small country. Why would we do that? And she took it upon herself to investigate that further. Um, the Panama Deception proved that the information the public got was in no way similar to what was reported to us at that time. Uh, the police force that went down to Panama was far too excessive to, you know, to bring back what we considered to be a criminal, Manuel Noriega. And we're going to show you a bit of the film uh, after this introduction, and you'll get a feeling for, for what went on there. But Barbara has the opportunity. Oh, pardon me. We're going to be showing the Academy acceptance. I'm sorry. Uh, not a piece of the film. That was last week. This is the Academy acceptance. Um, but Barbara has a very special capacity. She asks the questions, you know, why? She asks what happened, you know? And we need people to ask these questions. Uh, on the newsroom ceiling over in Kedzie Hall, which is where the Collegian is produced, and, and I guess I have the privilege of working there, although in the past few days I'm not sure... Uh, I can say that with a straight face. Um, there's a quote from Thomas Jefferson, and it says that information is the currency of democracy. It is so important to have a freedom of the press, and it is so important that we have the opportunity to bear witness to facts and figures and the information that we need to know to function in a democracy, because that information is essential to the decisions that we make. Network news and the papers and radio does not have the opportunity to bring us the information that we need, uh, at least to the depths that, that we would require it. And it is people like, like Barbara Trent who go and find the facts and find the whole story and then present it to us. Um, I was pretty amazed. In the Panama Deception, there's a scene with Dan Rather giving the evening news. And he has a 30-second spot where he's talking about uh, how the UN voted to uh, condemn the United States for its invasion of Panama. And there are plenty of instances throughout history where the UN has voted to condemn a country, China, Kosovo, Somalia, South Africa. Uh, always there's some human rights abuses going on when the UN votes to do that. And all of a sudden they were voting to condemn us. And we're the seat of democracy, theoretically. Um, and the fact that a news newscaster like Dan Rather, the man who took over for Walter Cronkite, would just spend seven seconds on that during a newscast, I found to be quite remarkable, especially as a journalist. I didn't understand how that could happen. Um, what we come to is the fact that while we are protected by the freedom of the press, we also perceive ourselves as being protected by our military. But for those of you who came to see Howard Zinn several weeks ago, uh, you probably have an understanding that any war is a bad war. There's no such thing as a good, clean war. When we went down to, uh, to I guess, uh, free Kuwait, uh, the, uh, 
the 1st Infantry Division, which used to be housed over here nearby at Fort Riley, took bulldozers and buried 10,000 Iraqi soldiers alive while they were still in their trenches. And for all intents and purposes, what happened in the Middle East was what we would describe as being a just war. We were not being the aggressors, we were helping to liberate a small country. Uh, at least that was, that was the spin that was put on things. Barbara Trent came from uh, a background of being very active socially, but she had... Oh, you're going to do this part. Okay, well this is a good part for me to lead into it. Um, listen to her very carefully. Because her... Uh, if, you, if you catch the details of what she's been through and where she came from, uh, there are lessons there that are important for all of us to learn. And with that, here's her accepting her Academy Award. And after that, Barbara will be up here to speak. So thank you very much for coming. It's um, organizing in the Midwest for years is once people begin with the smallest little act, they start to take a stake in it, a position. It becomes one of their issues, and I think that's really important. Now let's look at the nominated documentary features. They are Changing Our Minds, the story of Dr. Evelyn Hooker, David Hogland, producer. Fires of Kuwait, Sally Dundas, producer. Liberators, fighting on two fronts in World War II, William Miles, Nina Rosenblum, producers. Music for the movies, Bernard Herman, Margaret Smilo, Roma Barron Producers. The Panama Deception, Barbara Trent, David Casper Producers. And the Oscar for Best Achievement in Documentary Features goes to The Panama Deception, Barbara Trent and David Casper Producers. I'd like to acknowledge uh, a most remarkable man, uh, the writer, the editor, one of the producers, the co-founder and co-director of the Empowerment Project, which supports many filmmakers every year, David Casper. <laughs> as well as the other two producers without whose perseverance the film would never have been completed, Nico Paniguti and Joanne Dorishow. We'd like to take a moment and dedicate this film to all the people who have worked so hard for justice and truth and peace around the world, and particularly the four people who have died who were working in association with this film, and the hundreds and possibly thousands of Panamanians who died in this invasion, whose stories might never otherwise be told because of the deceptive practices and tactics of our government in with the complicity, I don't like it either, but it's the way it is, with the complicity of the major media. We would like to also dedicate the film to the courageous Panamanian journalists and human rights activists who have defied the Panamanian ban against the screening of this film at personal risk to show it in the last few weeks in Panama, which, by the way, reversed the censorship ban, which was nationwide, and to the millions of Americans who may or may not get to see this film now that public TV has also refused a broadcast. 
In, in closing, I'd just like to say we have a tremendous amount of potential in the world, and those of us here have a, a tremendous amount of potential to impact the world. Let's use it. Let's challenge this new administration to reverse the legacy that we have left through our policies in the world and become the Americans that we're capable of. Thank you very, very much. Okay. He, uh, what's his name, the man that, the, the MC, uh, Crystal, he came up and his comment was, that's a record, because <laughs> he kind of had to take the stage back. Um, they were hissing at me, which is why I threw up my hands and said, uh, hey, I don't like it either, it's just the way they were. The audience started hissing. I was mortified. Um, but then they quit because they understood that I acknowledged them and uh, was actually in agreement. Um, I hadn't seen it in a while either. It's always kind of exciting. Thanks for having me here. It's a real delight. Uh, it's been nice that the weather got warm when I came here, even though I was prepared for cold weather. Um, and I'm just happy to be a part of this lecture series that um, brings a wide variety of people um, to Manhattan, Kansas, who might not otherwise be here. Um, and so I also want to thank Mrs. Douglas uh, for helping to make this possible. Um, I've been an activist since the 60s, um, as some of my friends here can, uh, <laughs> can uh, vow to. Um, I really got involved, I mean, I'm, I'm 52, so I was part of that generation that was really steeped in, in activism. Um, I, was, I went to college in 64, so it was during the Vietnam War. I was immensely active in trying to make it clear to this government that there would be no business as usual until this war ended and we brought our boys back. Um, and stopped killing the people over there, stopped killing the people over there and stopped allowing our uh, sons to be uh, cannon fodder for a war that, uh, in my opinion, was illegal and immoral. So, you know, we closed down the highways and we closed down the Illinois, we used to be called the Illinois Central Railroad, Amtrak, and um, we closed down the university and someone, which I won't take personal responsibility for, burnt down the ROTC building. So they sent in the National Guard, and we got our first uh, taste of, of um, population control, of how a country deals with this kind of uprising. Um, and it was really a, a good lesson for me, and an important and a valuable one, and only uh, strengthened my determination that, uh, that we were out in the streets um, because that's where we had to be at the time, because if you don't use your rights, you will eventually lose them. And the right to dissent is one of the most important rights that we have in this country. And it is critical that we use it um, with all the energy we have. Um, but inform ourselves first, <laughs> which is not easy to do. Um, as, the, uh, as a part of the 60s, I was also involved in, um, I'm trying to kind of tell you how I got from where I was to where I am. Not that it's a terribly different place, it's mostly just a matter of perseverance. Um, as a part of the 60s, I was also involved in the whole drug milieu that existed during that time and the, uh, the late 60s and the early 70s. And one of the things that happened was uh, someone died in our community, and it was unnecessary, and the person who died was just left in front of the hospital dead. Nobody wanted to even bring him in because they didn't want to be involved in the fact that there were drugs involved, and they didn't want to be questioned because maybe they were doing drugs too. But the reality was nobody knew what to do. So a group of us set out and set to, get, to do something about the situation. We, we eventually got money partly from the university and set up a place called Synergy, which was a uh, drug crisis 
intervention and a life crisis intervention center. And we started training people. We ended up training doctors and police and students and parents uh, with a very non-judgmental approach to the drug issue. Um, we would begin by saying, if you do this drug and you get caught, your life's ruined, okay, because <laughs> it's against the law. So let's start with that. We all know that. Now let's move on. And what we would move on to was people's personal health and the quality of people's lives. And it was the most effective drug program I have ever seen. Um, it no longer, it, well, it's, it's been in existence until I think about a year ago I was there and that the building had been torn down, which was one of Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes. And, um, but I think that the program was still running in, out of some other building, but it's been running since 1970. And I have yet to see a similar kind of program uh, anywhere in this country that just takes a rational approach to the issue. Uh, our country still seems to be trying to convince people to just say no, and they're not just saying no, and at some point we have to uh, get real with that uh, reality. Um, what we did was we tried to explain to people, if you're using this drug, and we would explain how each drug worked and how everything they needed to know about it, and we would explain to them all of the vitamins and all of the minerals that are depreciated from their body every time they used it. So there was an actual, actually a recipe that people would take to try to stay, to try to keep their body and their brain intact so that they could have a good quality of life, and if someday they chose to stop doing drugs, they would have as close to the body and the brain they started with as possible. So it was an effort to deal with people's health. And when you approach an issue that way, people listen. And just, just be, I mean, we did a lot of things. We also had um, lots of activities for them to be involved in, alternative to drugs. We actually tested drugs. People would bring us a drug. We got permission from the police to then take, to be in possession of an illegal drug, take it to a lab, have it analyzed. People would call back up, give us the number that they had given us, you know, I'm number 265, and we would tell them what, in fact, was in that drug. And once people started realizing they were spending a lot of money for drugs that weren't really what they were paying for, it wasn't really cocaine, it was epinephrine, and it was, uh, it was uh, you know, methamphetamine, and it was maybe laced with strychnine or arsenic, which gave you a quicker rush. Uh, when people saw the garbage they were paying for, that also clicked for them. Well, wait a minute, I can't trust this thing I buy on the street. And when a real bad drug hit the street, we would actually put posters up in town and the radio stations would actually participate and say don't buy the microdot, the blue microdot LSD, it's, it's laced with strychnine. Um, but the whole community worked together and in doing so I think we were able to really make a difference. We did not treat people who were doing drugs as adversaries. Um, nor did we treat anybody as adversaries and the police and the doctors came to trust us and work with us and it was another lesson for me in how we could, that people who have an ex, people, that we all have experiences we can share, that we can turn into useful tools to address the problems of society. Um, so that was, uh, that was that period. Um, I meant to actually start back a little further earlier, and I'll just say a few words about what I think influenced me even to get to that stage. Um, I think that the, I know the name of this uh, lecture is A Woman of Courage, which is somewhat presumptuous, um, but I think that the secret to being courageous is to simply always try to do the right thing, uh, right now and every day. And then the question becomes, well, how do you learn what is the right thing? Where do you figure that out? I was very fortunate. Um, I had wonderful parents. I learned very early what was right and what was wrong. And I think telling right from wrong is really pretty simple. And, and I, I, I don't think there's as much gray as people would like to suggest. Um, there was one incident that uh, has always stayed with me. Um, I was a young kid, I don't know how old, maybe 10, 11, 
I don't know, 9, 10, 11. Um, and I used to go to work with my dad on Saturday. He ran a wholesale food house. And I would go there and I'd make, you know, 50 cents or a quarter an hour. Obviously, he never heard of the union, right? <laughs> but um, that's not true. He actually did support the union. Um, and I would work with this woman, this black woman named Willie B. And what she did, this, is, this, this was a while ago, she would be checking eggs in this just this solid black room with a box and, and a hole in the box, and behind that box was a light bulb, so light just came out of one place. So she'd pick four eggs up in one hand and four in the other, and she'd look at each egg. And as she looked at it, you know, if there's darkness coming through, it means there's an embryo, which means the egg is starting to become a chicken, and it's not good, and she'd put it in this bad, bad box. And she would do this, it was amazing. She would twirl four and look, and while she was looking at the other, she would just keep twirling these eight eggs and then, and then take another bunch. And she, we just loved her. Every time she found a bad one, she'd let us break it into this box, which you can imagine. Now, this young woman's got the picture, what it smelled like. And we were too little, me and my sister, to realize how horrid that was. But she knew it made us happy. So she let us do this. She was just this wonderful woman we worked with and uh, uh, knew very well. And one day, uh, one of, my dad, this wholesale food business sold to big places, institutions, schools, restaurants. One day, this guy pulls up and it was uh, one of the owners of the, one of the restaurants. They'd run out of chicken and a few other things. And they didn't send over somebody from the kitchen because those people work. They need them, you know. <laughs> they actually are the people who make the food. Uh, so the owner jumped in his car and ran over, and uh, he needed some chicken. So Willoughby and I went in the back and went into the freezer chest, which was always fun. It's one of those big walk-in freezers, and you're always afraid you'll get trapped in there. And uh, we loaded up uh, a crater to a chicken. She brought him out, and she was loading him into the back of this guy's trunk. And he looks at my dad, and he said, Walter, I don't want, and I'm not going to say the word, it would be the unkind word for a black person, touching my food. And my dad never, never blinked. He didn't add up what this client was worth in a year, how many restaurants were in this chain. He never gave it a second thought. He just said, John, if you've got a problem with that, we've got a problem, because Willie B. just does almost everything around here. And I've never forgotten it, because in actuality, there were a variety of graceful ways he could have gotten out of that. He could have said, oh, Willie B., let me do it, right? There's a lot of ways he could have snuggled out of that and let it go unchallenged. But he never blinked an eye. Um, similarly, during the, uh, one of the Teamsters strikes, and the people who worked at Byman's refused to strike. There was just seven or eight uh, drivers. They said, it's a small company, you treat us so well. The next day, one of their trucks were shot at. He brought them all in. He sat them down. He said, there's not one of you whose lives are more important than this business. I mean, all of, any, all of your lives are more important than this business. Go home, we'll survive. But he always seemed to know what was right. Now, I was a little kid. Maybe it just seemed that way because I was a little kid. But some of these things will always be a part of, I believe, who I am, as well as the nurturing um, that my mother gave me. And I think it's what's given me the strength to be able to take risks and to be flexible in my thinking and to engage new ideas and other cultures um, and it's something a lot of people don't have. I, I've been a little ill, so I have to spray myself every now and then. I, it's just herbs. <laughs> I'm going to be careful after what I say, huh? You can have it analyzed. I think it's got too much golden seal, to tell you the truth. Um, so I think that's a lot of what's given me some of the uh, bravado to do, to do what I do. Um, As the 70s were uh, coming on, I found myself pregnant. I was a real 60s kid, kid, okay? I mean, when I say my parents were good, they weren't only good, they were good and they stuck by me through a whole lot that I hope you don't put your parents through. And I was lucky my son never put me through it. 
but um, I found myself pregnant, if that's what you say, <laughs> found myself. <laughs> and um, I was in a difficult situation at the time, so uh, I went to the welfare office and uh, tried to sign up. This was Southern Illinois. This was 1969. And I'm telling you, they, they, I, they hired this woman to be the most intimidating, the person who you had to deal with, the most intimidating person you could deal with. She basically looked at me with the look that, listen, honey, we're going to be supporting you and your bastard child for the next 18 years, and you're going to regret every day of it. Trust me. And uh, it was true. It was the way they treated people. It was the way I was treated. I only stayed on for, I don't know, a year and a half. I went off, and then I think I went back on food stamps for a little while. Not food stamps. I went back and got the health card for a, a little while, and then finally got off, was making enough money that I could actually afford doctor visits as well. Um, but it was such a... Um, life-changing experience again that anybody would be treated that way. And I was from a middle-class family, and I had part of my education, at least by then. Um, I eventually went on and got a master's degree, but this was kind of midway. Um, and I wasn't used to being treated like that. And I think part of the key of changing the world is you deal with the stuff in front of your nose. And what was in front of my nose was the way I was being treated. So I began to organize other welfare parents and other families. And we started organizing and coming back to the county and demanding better treatment and got more information out to more rural uh, communities and more indigenous people regarding the kinds of services that they needed to avail themselves of in order to get off of welfare. And it's, it's something that, at least then, uh, welfare didn't do. They just assumed you wanted to be lazy and have kids and live off the dole, and uh, they didn't give you an opportunity to get off. When I finally got off, I wrote them this long letter explaining to them how to change the system. <laughs> They never responded. <clears throat> but, I mean, my suggestion was something simple like, you know, if you had just sat down with me, I could have said, hey, okay, you know, I, I made some mistakes here. Give me two years or give me a year and a half. Uh, let me finish my degree, have a vehicle that runs, and, um, and work part-time, uh, and then I'll work full-time. Just give me a little bit of support for a little while, and I'll be out of your hair. But they don't do that. They just, give, give, they just give you a little enough. They give you just a little less than you need. So you're always scraping, and you're always doing everything inefficiently, and you're hauling your own water because your running water's not working, and your car's breaking down, and you can't get off. They keep you tied up in it real nice. And as soon as you get off, you lose your medical card, which then was called a green card. So when your kid's sick, you can't take them to the doctors. So you can't afford to get off. And it's something that we're still dealing with today, despite the letter <laughs> I sent them. <laughs> um, keep your eye on the way welfare reform is working. Keep your eyes on how many more people are going to be thrown. It sounds good, the workfare program. You know, you go out and you work. Keep your eye on how many people aren't getting health care, aren't getting adequate uh, diets as we, so to speak, reform the welfare system. And, and try, please, to remember they might not have been born into a family like you were born into. They might not have the advantage of having parents that thought college was actually a, a, a reasonable goal. Um, it's just really important to try to get inside of other people's shoes. Um, anyway, I did so well at that, that I eventually got hired by the Jackson County Mental Health Clinic to, uh, and then they started paying me to do this. And it was so funny because before then, one, somebody, or at some point, someone said, you know, Barbara, how could you accept welfare? I mean, you know, you almost had a bachelor's degree, you're 
you know, fairly privileged, you, you know, how could you do that? And I said, man, that was a steal this country was getting. I was getting a few hundred bucks and food stamps and a medical card, and I was doing all this organizing. Now they're paying me a professional salary to do the same thing. It's still tax dollars, because that's who pays Jackson County Mental Health Clinic. I was now a counselor, making, I don't know what, 10, 12,000, whatever, but a whole lot more than I made on welfare. So it's also important to, to, to think of all of us getting state and federal money as being on welfare. Teachers are on welfare. Government workers are on welfare. We're all taking tax dollars. So if a person's poor and they're taking tax dollars and they're doing good things for their community and you're just giving them a little below, below minimum salary for the work they're doing, we're getting a steal. And it shouldn't be a steal, but we're getting a steal. So that was always interesting to me. As I, as I moved on and started getting paid more and more, it was really odd, you know, that now I was being paid to do the same thing I was doing when I was getting food stamps. Now they were giving me all this money. Not that I ever got rich off of it, but um, from there, um, we got so effective. Um, I was working with pre-adjudicated kids. In other words, kids could either go to jail or they could work with me. So this was, <laughs> yeah, this was my introduction to the kids. So I, of course, told them, hey, you don't have to like me. It's okay. You don't even have to talk to me. You just have to spend an hour in the same room with me once a week. Bring a book, anything you want, or we can talk. And we ended up starting programs together to change the community because I and these kids agreed there was nothing wrong with them. They were acting out in, a, in what would be a reasonable way in an unreasonable world. That they were coming from communities that had nothing for young people to do after school, so they found something. What? Throwing a rock through somebody's window or stealing somebody's bike or drinking behind the barn or whatever. So we started creating together more interesting things for them to do. And um, it became very effective, and pretty soon state agencies were coming to us trying to give us money because they said, since you've been working in some of these towns, we have not had to put one kid away. So if every kid that comes to your dance classes and your, you know, everybody in the community taught what they knew and the kids would come and there was this wonderful interchange between the young and the old and it was just really uh, wonderful. We called it the Rural Creative Workshop. And um, so Children and Family Services and the Criminal Justice Department were coming and saying, you know, get anybody who comes to any of these classes, if they're willing to sign up and not afraid or paranoid to be, so to speak, on the rolls, you know, their name, we'll fund you for each one of them because you're saving us a fortune in terms of what it costs once these kids, so to speak, go bad. Well, we got so effective that we uh, ended up going back to the county, uh, to the mental health clinic, and saying, you know what? The communities, it was always part of the plan. They'd run these programs on their own, and they're ready to now. We don't need to get direction from the mental health clinic, from the professionals. And we turned over, the, everybody turned over the backs of their tax slips. Most of you are too young to pay real estate tax, but when you do, you'll get a little card or a slip, and on it, it'll tell you where your money goes, how much goes for roads, how much goes for schools, how much goes for each thing. And we totaled up the amount of money. Well, we went to the county records. We didn't add everybody's things up. We went to the county and looked up the records and totaled up how much these little rural... Uh, towns were paying for mental health, and we came up with a, a pretty healthy number. And then we found out how many of these people went to the mental health clinic for help. We were looking at zero. And the mental health clinic was saying, well, you know, we, we don't know how to help these people. So we said, not a problem. This is what they're putting in. Just send it back. We know how to do it, because we're them. We are these people. We're not stupid. Give us some money. We know what this community needs. We live in it. And, of course, that's when the FBI got involved with Barbara Trent. <laughs> Stepped on one too many toe. And that was during the 70s. That was during the COINTELPRO operations, counterintelligence counterintelligence program. That was a program that was used to discredit people within the movement, 
Now, people, someone today in the class asked me, am I ever afraid of getting shot? They don't need to shoot me. They just need to keep me poor, which they're doing real good at. They, they, and they need to discredit me, which they're having a hard time now that I got the Oscar. Um, but this is what they used against the Panthers in the 70s. This is, the, this is what they used against Martin Luther King. This is how they brought down the movement in many ways, was to discredit people. And that was their uh, approach with me. It locked up about 14 months of my life. Somebody called me one day and said, had I seen the news? And I said, no. Why? And they said, well, you've just been indicted on eight federal felony charges. So I uh, sat down at the kitchen table and looked at my son and said, we got to get out of here. <laughs> we can't stay in this house. And uh, we got in the car and we left and we couldn't even leave a note for my husband because we figured if we left a note, whoever came would read it. Um, and stayed underground just for a few days and a lawyer came forward to uh, offer to represent me pro bono, you know, for no charge. And uh, I, was I was assuming, having come from the 60s, that they, it was a Friday. I was assuming, oh, yeah, they think they're going to arrest me on Friday and keep me all through the weekend before I get to see a judge and bail out, right? I didn't realize it was such a civil arrangement when it's the FBI. You, you arrange to surrender yourself to them in, uh, in East St. Louis, it was. And um, anyway, it, it finally all worked out, but it took up about 14 months of my life, during which time I wasn't able to effectively work. And that was the uh, purpose, and it, uh, and it worked. Now, luckily, a lot of people still had a lot of faith in me, and despite all this, the, um, I was hired by the Action Agency under Jimmy uh, Carter to train VISTAs and Peace Corps volunteers. So now my title was Expert Senior Training Specialist. Um, and once again, I was just doing the same thing I had been doing as a welfare mother, but they were paying me 100 bucks a day. Um, I was a contract worker. I worked there for a while. Um, the FBI came after me twice while I was there. Um, because they had, even though they had done a, a uh, review of me, uh, somehow I slipped through the crack on them, and nobody had lied or anything. I don't know what happened. The right hand doesn't always know what the left's doing. One day I was in an airplane, and this woman said, Gosh, Barbara Trent, I haven't seen you in ages, and how bizarre. I just got a call from the FBI last week about you. I said, What? And she said, Yeah, I guess there's some kind of investigation. I said, There is. So I got to work which was in Chicago. I'd fly from Southern Illinois to uh, Chicago a few days out of each week. And, um, and I joined the union that day. I wasn't in the union because I was an appointed employee and we didn't really get any benefits from the union, but I joined the union uh, and immediately asked the union steward to uh, open up my case, you know, to ask the FBI to, to, to inquire if there was, in fact, an investigation. Of course, they denied it, and we finally caught them in the middle of it. We kind of caught them with their pants down. So um, I won that one, um, and I lost the last. I, I lost one round. I won one round, and one round with them was a draw. But it's, uh, it's always been interesting. Um, so the last one was a draw. I... Um, I left, uh, eventually left because they were, Reagan had just come in and was getting rid of all of the trainers for Vista, including myself. Uh, they flew out of Washington, wanted my, uh, uh, not retirement, resignation, that's the word, <laughs> immediately. And to my surprise, the head of the action agency in Region 5 said, no, he'd fight, go back and litigate. So they left, in fact, to litigate uh, against Region 5. Um, but, and then my boss came to me and he said, well, how many days do you have left? And I said, well, I got 14 days left on my contract. And he said, well, do whatever you think is important <laughs> and send me the bill because uh, this is the end for all trainers and we need to get your end out of here before they come and, and hit you again, basically. So that's what I did. So now I didn't have a job and uh, my uh, husband of 10 years uh, departed about the same month fairly unexpectedly, um, literally the classic going out to get a pack of cigarettes, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, 
So I didn't really have a life in Southern Illinois left. I moved to California. I was involved in a trip to the United Nations Special Session on Disarmament. Someone made a film about us. I thought, wow, what a concept. You can make a film and use it to transfer this information. And hooked up with one of the people on that crew, David Casper, and started making films. And it has just been an eye-opener to me. Um, we started in 80, well, that was 82, so we started, yeah, we started at the end of 82. Uh, in that time, we made some small films, one to get school buses for the town we lived in, and we also made some big ones, Destination uh, Nicaragua in, in, uh, in 84, about the illegal war against the Sandinistas, the CIA Contra war, uh, cover-up behind the Iran-Contra affair in 1988, which is based on the premise that the hearings were in and of themselves a cover-up. That by being limited by the dates they couldn't go past or before and by being limited to a certain number of transactions they could only investigate, they never really got into the big scandals, the, the CIA's involvement with drugs, the plan to suspend the Constitution under, uh, with Oliver North and uh, George Bush under uh, Giafrida. Um, the real stories never came out. They were always hammered down and taken into executive session. Um, and then just a few years after that, we woke up one day and George Bush said he was sending 26,000 troops in the stealth fighter to arrest one man in Panama. We said, whoa, this must be some guy. <laughs> He's not living in an underground bunker. This is Panama. We have the largest accumulation of military personnel and weapons outside of the continental United States in this entire hemisphere is in Panama. Something like 14,000 standing troops, 10 to 14,000 at any time. And we're sending in 26,000 more troops to arrest one guy. What is going on here? So we went down to try to find out. And uh, and I hope you do get a chance or, or find a chance to see the film because what we found out was that the four reasons given to us by George Bush were lies, that our, that our young people, that our whole country was duped. It was another Gulf of Tonkin situation in a sense. Um, and the part of that me, that, a part of that that is to me really upsetting and what aggravates me so much when I see in the newspaper all this, uh, you know, this incredible media and government attention on, on the Lewinsky affair, when we're about to, to bomb Serbia, where we have an embargo against the people of Iraq and there are children dying every day because they don't have clean water because we bombed out the infrastructure, I mean, there are major things happening in this world that are life and death related, and it seems to me that's what we need to be hearing from the media. We need the information to make decisions that represent who we are as people, and most of us, I would guess, as people, are not benefiting from the policies that our government carries out around the world. When we throw a country back into the third world, when we land our troops to put down union organizing and to kill missionary workers and uh, the whole faith-based community, for instance, in Central America, working with, with indigenous people trying to change their country, we do it in the roos, under the roots of fighting drugs or we do it under the roots of fighting communism or narco-terrorism. But what's really happening is we're keeping that country safe for corporate exploitation. As long as they don't have unions in Indonesia, Nike can get a pair of shoes made for 50 cent, 75 cents and sell them here for $150 and kids are shooting each other on the playground to get those shoes. And the people in this country don't have jobs because they're in Indonesia and they're in, in Latin America 
because our troops, our military, our CIA makes sure to keep those places safe for cheap labor. So it's really important that we begin to try to follow the dollar when we read the news. Who's going to benefit from this? Whenever you read that we're going someplace to, to, to bring democracy to a country or something, just once, please, <laughs> just assume that's not true, just for the heck of it. Carte blanche, just assume, well, let's say that's not true. What would be another reason? Who would benefit? Who's going to benefit? And that'll lead you to why we're doing what we're doing. And that's what the media should be talking about, because we have the right to know. Because if people in this country think that we should keep the canal zone and not return those military bases and the canal to Panama in the year 2000, then we should have that debate. Jimmy Carter signed a, a treaty to give it back to Panama in the year 2000, 2000 the canal treaties. Ronald Reagan ran on a, on a platform that will never give it back. Under the Bush administration, we invade and wipe out their military. The canal treaties state very clearly, if Panama can't demonstrate its ability to protect the canal, it's the obligation of the U.S. military to stay in Panama beyond the year 2000. Now, young people in this country make a deal with this country when they join the military. They say, I need a job or I need an education, I can't afford to go to college, whatever. I'm going to join the military. Or I want to protect my country, whatever. I'm going to join the military. And I agree that if this honest and open government and this courageous and independent media and this participatory citizenship we call the United States of America, if those three things all come together and say, there is no other way but for me to go to this other country and kill other human beings or be killed, I will do that. That's the deal they sign with us. And when I look at the invasion of Panama, there is only one part of this group of people who made this deal who kept their deal. And that was those young people who went down there and fought that dirty war. And some of them died, and they killed a lot of other people. And a lot of them are, will never be the same. They come out of the woodwork. They come to see our film all over. There's no platform for them to talk about what happened to them. It's not Vietnam. We ha it's not, there's not been a big debate. People can't come forward and say what we did was wrong, and I'm still shaking, and I can't keep hold down a job, and I have cold sweats at night. That's what these young people are going through, because they know what they did there. And the rest of this country doesn't want to hear it because we won that war. End of debate. So all I'm saying to you is, in a world where decisions are really life and death, for goodness sakes, let's do our part as citizens. Let's demand that the media does their part. Let's demand that the government does their part. Um, I wrote a, just a few quick thoughts. Um, I'll just throw them out. I'll just take a minute, a few little paragraphs I wrote last night in some kind of stupor after we'd gone out. <laughs> but I looked at the morning and this morning thought, those are good. <laughs> And that is kind of what makes me tick. I have a healthy sense of outrage, and yet I think an appreciation for grace. Insisting on right behavior is really important, but still always allowing people a graceful way to do that. In other words, before you hit somebody over the head for their opinion, give them some information. Before you push somebody up against the wall, give them a way out. Help people find the right thing to do before you escalate, which is the next thought, to exhaust all remedies prior to every level of escalation of any kind of activism. So what is courage? Hmm, it's not always spontaneous. It does not always feel, it's not always what feels the best. It's not always cathartic. 
It's very simple. It's the best you can do at any given time in the face of cynicism, in the face of overwhelming obstacles, simply doing the best you can do, balancing your ability to contribute with an acceptance of the reality of your impact. Rear Admiral Eugene LaRocque always says it doesn't matter what you do, whether you write letters or call radio stations or tie yourself to million-year-old redwoods or chain yourself in front of tractors about to take down the redwoods. It doesn't matter what you do. Just do it every day. Do something every day, whether it's just talking to the next person to you in line at the grocery store about what they think about something, or letting a guy in front of you turn when instead of, well, in LA, they just blow their head off, road rage. Try to do something every day, consciously, to make this a better place, this whole planet that we live on. And uh, together, I think we can make that work. Voila, I'll take your questions. <laughs> Thanks. There's mics here for people who uh, have a comment or a question, and if I don't know the answer, I know there's some people in here who do, so I'm going to expect a little backup. Okay. Uh, Ms. Trent, I'm Matt Molina from the Capital Journal, our daily newspaper, Topeka, and I happen to see your uh, interview with uh, Alec Baldwin, or is it Alex? Uh, Alec. Alec, <laughs> on the Sundance Channel, and of course I got so many questions I'd like to ask you, but you know, you, you sort of criticize the national media especially uh, for the uh, getting all, uh, uh, presenting the Lewinsky thing as all this uh, entertainment that really is uh, uh, news rather than enter entertainment, and, and you know, you said, well, how come 60 Minutes can uh, go after some little small town mayor or something, but they won't tackle the big subjects. And, uh, you know, I wondered if you could sort of elaborate on that. Uh. Sure. I, I think one of the things that happens in the media um, is that PBS on Frontline or 60 Minutes. And I, I you know, I later regretted uh, that I, where'd you go? Was that, that was you, okay. I later regretted that I had used 60 Minutes as an example because they actually did that to expose on the amount of people that were killed in Panama before anyone else did, and they used our footage, and I kind of felt badly I had somehow picked them out. But anyway, what, uh, you know, once you do it on an interview on TV, it's done. Uh, <laughs> But um, one thing that happens very often is Frontline or some, some TV show will do what seems like a critical look at something. They'll either go after somebody small, like some corrupt mayor in some small town, like, oh, great, uh, you know, like, okay, that's kind of cool human interest story, but hello, shouldn't that be local news? But, you know, how, what do we, how do we translate that information? How does that do us good? Um, so that's one of the problems. They go out, they do these hard-hitting pieces against little nobodies all over the world. The other bigger problem, really, that I have is that they do pieces that appear to be critical but don't really get to the heart of it. They're, they do a lot of what I call ain't it a shame films. You know, there's a hole in the ozone and pretty soon we're going to all die of skin cancer and, you know, different species are going to be destroyed and... So please recycle. You know, it's like... <laughs> I mean, literally, that's about all the only thing they suggest we can do at this point, you know, save our little bottles and cans, which we all do, I'm sure. I want to know the names of the corporations that are the biggest polluters. I want to know the names of the people who sits on their board of directors. I want to know where they go to church. I want to know the clubs they belong to. It's the truth. The way JP... <laughs> you betcha. When I, a lot of people might have seen the film Norma Ray that was based on when J.P. Stevens actually uh, uh, fought and got their, got their first um, union contract. I mean, the, the workers did. The problem was there were no teeth in that contract, actually. And years later, there was a, a big move to put some teeth in that contract. And there was another big labor dispute and went on and on and on. And you know what those workers did? Um, and I can't remember the guy who organized it, but he's in Michael 
no, no, he's in Barbara, Barbara Koppel's film, American Dream. He organized those labor workers, and they found out, not just the corporate heads of J.P. Stevens, they found out the banks that were the financiers that, that floated the loans, the, the, you know, the, the money linked to J.P. Stevens. They found out who sat on their board of directors at Chase Bank. They found out which clubs their wives were president of, like the uh, Philharmonic Society in that town or the, you know, the Flower Club, and that's where they demonstrated with their pickets. Mrs. Johnson, husband, stars, children in Kentucky, or whatever. And you know, those women came home crying, and those men went to, went to the bank and said, I didn't work all my life to be the, on the board of the directors of this bank to have my wife humiliated because <laughs> J.P. Stevens can't settle an argument with their workers. You tell them, settle, I don't care what they give away, settle now. And the workers won. Now oh, there's a story for you. And some people say, oh, how rude. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, well, Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins stood up at the Academy Awards and you know, they took 20 seconds, not like six minutes like I did, they took 20 seconds in their presentation to say there are, I can't remember, 150 or 250 people being held at Guantanamo Bay, Haitians, whose only crime is that they are HIV positive. And people thought, oh, there was a big stink in the media. Oh, how rude. It was the Academy Awards. How dare they take that 20 seconds to do that? You know what? Those 250 people were released within a month, within like two weeks, because of that statement. I say a little bit of rudeness is well worth it when you've got people's lives on the line. It's easy for us. Thank you. <laughs> there's, there's a difference between being rude and putting a bullet in someone's head. That's rude. Go ahead. Um, what are you working on now? Um, my father. <laughs> Literally. Um, my, dad t my mom died about two years ago and I spent a lot of time helping her. It was an eight-year struggle with Parkinson's and um, my dad's really started to deteriorate since she died and, um, and has some dementia now. I moved him up and I've been taking care of him for about the last five and a half years months. Um, I'm thinking about doing something about Indonesia. Ever since my mom got, ever since she started getting really ill, I've been hesitant to jump. I just haven't had the energy to jump full force into something because I don't know if it's hard to get yanked out of that if you're in the middle of it and, and you really do need to deal with family. And, and that is, there's a lot of people, any one of you can go out and do what I would do in Indonesia, but only I'm the one who can probably do what I can do for my father. So... Every time people say, oh, you have to do this film on this, and I say, no, I don't. I have to take care of my father. That's what I'm choosing to do. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, he just moved into an assisted care place 10 minutes from my house um, two weeks ago, so we're going to see what, what happens. Uh, maybe Indonesia, maybe something on Indonesia. I, I, I've been gun-shy since Panama. Panama was a killer, literally. We had crew members die. We had people associated with the film die. We all went broke. I finally declared bankruptcy. Our whole organization imploded. I mean, there was a price to pay. Um, and people always say, but you won the Oscar. Doesn't that make it all worth it? And I say, ask, ask that of the family who lost their loved one. Uh, if I had known what it was going to cost me to do any of these three films, or most anything I've done in my life, I wouldn't have done it. You always, you know, you have that moment of, I'm going to do something about this, and then pff, it could be a year, it could be five years. Once you decide to do something, you really don't know what it's going to involve until you're done. And if you look back, you'd usually say, yow. If I'd known, I wouldn't have had the courage to do it. So I don't know if I should say a woman of courage or an ignorant one. <laughs> a woman with no foresight. <laughs> uh, you, Miss. Yes, I was just curious. You said that there were many things that had to come together for uh, us to declare war and send our American military. As a mother of somebody who is, uh, I'm assuming, about 28 years old, if the draft were actually ever uh, active once again, what would you do as a mother? And you sound like you're very bitter about the fact that it's just our soldiers who pay the full price, who know what they did, and that you know the government doesn't take any responsibility. Would you do anything to protect your son from being uh, 
forced into that situation where you know he was drafted up to be sent off to perform these evil deeds of you know or what I guess you're assuming are evil deeds that the government says that the military must do I mean well first of all I think it's inappropriate to think that there is no draft I remember when my son turned is it 16 or 18 18. I remember when that date was coming and you have so many weeks to go and register at the post office or some government office to fill out that form. I know this draft, child's alive. Yeah, the draft is still around, it's just not active. Right. And that's a real important thing for people to be to remember. Um, what we did when we decided to do that, we, we thought about not doing it, but it was a period of time when they were actually um, targeting the children of uh, whose parents were activists. They had just sentenced some kid to, I don't know, a few years or something for not having signed up. Uh, and so they were really looking at activist families, and they didn't want role models out there. Um, my son... Uh, didn't want to go to jail, so I said, oh, okay, that's, that's a fair choice. Um, we started a file with the, um, the Quakers. Um, I'm, I'm not a Quaker, but they keep those files, you know. You, can, you, you get a file going with some religious group that opposes war, and all the things that my son was participating in that ha would in any way suggest he would be a conscientious objector would go into that file. Um, and frankly, I, I, we always had an escape route. We always had a plan. Wherever we've lived, we've always had a plan. He's always had a passport, and we've always had a plan of where we'd meet. And I don't think that's a paranoia that exists now the way it did, but it's because of the because I think I'm, I lived through the Vietnam War that, that we just always had a plan, even before the draft, just in terms of if they came after uh, us for any kind of reason. Um, what would I do? I don't know. Whatever seemed to be the right thing at the time. I hope we'd all be out on the streets doing something. No business as usual. Thank you. Is there ever a time that a country should go to war? Is there ever a time that a country should go to war? Um, a country should go to war if it's been too lazy to do the right thing all along and things have gotten so bad that they're now being attacked. I mean, I don't, you know, it's like, no, I, I don't think there's, you know, I don't like war, and I think most of it could be avoided. Um, what I would use as a, as a present example is, um, I don't know if you, I want you to try to follow this in the media. It was a big, there was a big rush of it for a while, and I don't know if there, there will be the next time there's another terrorist attack. The next time there's a terrorist attack in this country, you watch the news real careful, okay? They will bring on, as they did the last time, they will bring on State Department people. They will bring on, uh, what's her name, uh, Madeleine uh, Albright. They will... <laughs> they, they will bring on all these people who will say to us, there's a price to pay for democracy, and we need to be willing to pay it. And the reality is that there's going to be terrorism in the United States, on our home ground. That's the way the world is going. And they're going to prepare us to accept that. And that's what the media was doing after the last incident, pre preparing us to accept that. Nobody in the media was saying, why would somebody want to plant a bomb in the United States? Nobody was asking, why do people hate us? What is the foreign policy that made this country so upset that it feels like the only way it can fight a fair fight with us is through terrorism? Because it certainly doesn't have the stealth fighter. It doesn't have our military budget. I mean, what is this concept of terrorism? If you drop a bomb from a plane, then that's not terrorism? Is that the deal? Terrorists are people who can't afford a plane. <laughs> the Pentagon admits that 25,000 people lost their homes 
In Panama, the Pentagon admits that 25,000 people's homes were built down in Panama. Human rights workers would say it's 35,000. They were civilians. They didn't do anything. Isn't that terrorism? Isn't that like blowing up the Oklahoma building? Hundreds. The, the Pentagon admits to hundreds of Panamanians dying. They admit that, over, that at least 75% of them were civilians. Human rights workers would say the numbers are in the thousands that die. I mean, I don't know what this terrorism definition is all about, but I'm telling you, if we drop bombs in Kosovo, civilians are going to die. So, I, you know, the answer is that we need to be diligent. We needed to start being diligent when the country was formed, and prior to that, you know, everybody else needed to. The issue is we're lazy until there's such a crisis that the only way to solve it is to shoot somebody. I don't know if there's ever an excuse for war. Um, I just don't know. I have so many questions, and I guess I should pick one so that it is not be confusing. Nice. <laughs> and... Uh, I think this question is a good um, following question good. Um, to the question of, uh, is there a need for a war? Um, should Americans seek on a governmental level to intervene in foreign countries' affairs? I don't know why you think I have an answer to this. <laughs> Let me run down my background again. There's no, always I'm kidding. more than I'm one kidding. answer. <laughs> um, intervene is, a, once again, an interesting word. Um, we have things like the Geneva Conventions. We have human rights laws. We have treaties that we're participants of um, that call for us to provide aid. I don't think there are, I guess, I guess NATO and some of those alliances also call for us to provide aggression if, if uh, someone we have a mutual uh, defense treaty with is aggressed upon. Um, I wouldn't mind us intervening if we did it for the right reasons. I have never seen us intervene for the right reasons. There has always been, it's always said, we're going to do this to save the people of Somalia, or we're going to do this to save these guys, or we're going to do this. But you know, the few things I have had the time to research or do films about, I know all those things were lies. If we ever did it, if there was a re, if we, if we acted out, out of humanitarian uh, concerns, I, I think that would lead to a kind of intervention that would be something that we would all be happy with. I don't, I don't think the ends justifies the means, and I don't think that, that the intent of most of our uh, interventions has anything to do with the best interests of the people here or the people there. I think it has to do with the best interests of a very small percentage of people on the planet uh, and, and large multinational corporations.